there's two, two interpretations. Either I'm delusional beyond belief, or you're, you're cruel. Ah, the politician already. <laughs> no. Never, never. 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 You be a teacher. Living in Justin Trudeau's Canada, it's a never, it's a never ending hallucinogenic surreal dream. Justin Trudeau's mode of governance is to top each scandal with a bigger scandal. Mm -hmm. And he's really good at that. And you might say, well, what's wrong with Canadians? And I can tell you what's wrong with Canadians is that Canadians have a very difficult choice to make. They can either wake up and realize that under the jurisdiction of this preposterous narcissist, we've compromised virtually every institution of integrity in Canada, which is a really bitter pill to, pill to swallow, or we can assume that everyone who's pointing that out is some sort of conspiracy theorist. And it's way easier for Canadians to follow, to swallow the latter story than to actually contend with the true ramifications of the former story. Now, unfortunately, the former story is true. I think our leader, Trudeau, I don't think I've ever heard him say a true word. You know, and I'm not trying to be overly dramatic in that regard. I've met people in my clinical practice and otherwise who were temperamentally incapable of any gesture or any word that was actually genuine. And that's a consequence of long practice. I think he's at least narcissistic, at minimum. And I think he's enabled by the useful idiots of the liberal left. And I actually think that's a very widespread problem and probably more typical of Canada now than any other developed country, much to our chagrin. And Canadians are shocked by this, you know, because they're shocked into disbelief, I would say, because for 175 years or thereabouts, well, let's say since, since Confederation, we won't go back any farther than that, it was 1867. 150 years, our institutions were reliable, derived as they were from Great Britain, which produced reliable institutions for all sorts of miraculous reasons. You could trust the political parties. The socialists were a labor party. The conservatives were a party of big business. The liberals kind of played both ends against the middle and were centrists and they were usually in power. And all things considered, that didn't work out too badly. You know, when we got tired of them, we could elect the conservatives which happened now and then federally, or the socialists or the conservatives, which happened fairly regularly provincially, and the whole damn country functioned well. The education system worked, the higher education systems were, you know, we don't have Harvard or Stanford, but all our universities were pretty damn good. Um, no duds in the lot, really. Um, Canada was a very stable, middle-class country with reliable institutions. and. And the media as well, even CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, when I grew up, it was fundamentally trustworthy, probably tilted somewhat to the left insofar as things were tilted towards the left, say in the 70s and so on. But you could, you could assume that the journalists at CBC were journalists, not propagandists. And it was the same with, we had CTV, which was the main private competitor, and the same thing obtained there. And that's all. To say that's gone is to say almost nothing. Canadians have no idea what to do with them. The thing about him and his minions is I don't trust them at all. I think that what Trudeau is doing is testing his fingers in the wind constantly to see where the easiest moral advantage can be obtained and then driving down that direction as fast as he possibly can. I don't believe for a second that he has any such thing as principles. It doesn't look because I don't think anybody who lies with every single word and gesture ever has principles. And that's how Trudeau governs in relationship to everything. He looks for the easiest moral advantage. We're saving the planet. It's like, yeah, I don't think so, buddy. It's not an easy thing to do to save the planet. And what are we going to do? We're going to go down Germany, the route of Germany, where electricity is now unreliable, super expensive, and 10 times as polluting in terms of carbon output per unit of electricity than France. That'll be Canada's destiny. We're slaughtering our fossil fuel industry, which basically means we're just handing it over to the Chinese, you know, the whole fossil fuel enterprise. I'm sure they're just laughing up their sleeves at our complete bloody idiocy. Yeah. So, you know, hypothetically, Trudeau is trying to tip us away from our colonial past, but I don't believe any of this is political. I think that he is, he's a narcissistic, dark tetrad type. You know, Canadians have no idea what Trudeau is and don't want to know. We've gone further down the woke road than, you know, any other place except perhaps for California. 
And I think part of the reason for that is that we were an early adopter of the doctrines of group rights. So back in the 1980s, Canada has almost split apart twice in recent years, and very, very close. There were two referenda, and both of them, to call the results marginal is to say almost nothing. It was fractions of a percent that kept the country together. And in the 1980s, uh, Trudeau's father, who was also quite the piece of work, repatriated, so to speak, our constitution. And I suppose that was in part because the French, the Francophones, so to speak, weren't very happy that we were still in some ways governed by Great Britain, although as far as I'm concerned, that was a perfectly good deal, especially compared to the alternative. And so we tried to bring the Constitution back and, and did so and produced a new Charter of Rights and a new Constitution and bent ourselves into knots trying to get Quebec to sign and in doing so, weakened the structural foundations of the Constitution and the Charter of Rights to a degree that really, I think, makes them not worth the paper they're written on and in a failed attempt to actually bring Quebec back into the fold. But in doing so, we also agreed that groups had rights. The Francophones had rights. The Indigenous people, as, as a group, had rights. The Anglophones had rights. There were three founding peoples, and group and individual rights had to be balanced. And I don't think there is any such thing as group rights because there's no such thing as group responsibility. So that's a, it's a non-starter conceptually. And so, they, the, in some ways, the table was set in Canada for the rise of a more universal doctrine of group identity and group rights. And plus, Canadians pride themselves on, you know, being nice, let's say, and, you know, and not being offensive and just hoping that everyone will get along. And, you know, there's nothing glorious about incivility, but there's very little to distinguish excessive niceness from weakness. And the problem with being nice, and this is a technical problem because niceness is associated with trait agreeableness, is that agreeable people are cannon fodder for psychopaths. And biologists have modeled this. So for example, if you put together automated communities of reciprocal cooperative traders, they do very well. You know, they, the whole pot expands. But if you throw one psychopath into the mix, he takes everything. And the reason for that is that if you're too agreeable, the dark tetrad types, the predatory parasites, they'll take you out. And they'll use your compassion as a weapon against you. I mean, we know that the, the people who suffer from the psychopathologies or manifest the psychopathologies that are associated with quasi-psychopathic traits are very much prone to using victimization as a weapon. So I don't believe that any of the conundrum that we're in at the moment in the West is strictly political. I think what's happened is that the, the predatory psychopaths have figured out how to cloak themselves in the guise of compassion and their machinations are enabled online. And this is dangerous beyond belief. I mean, first of all, we have a province in Canada, Alberta, which has the third largest fossil fuel reserves in the world. And we're very good at utilizing them, let's say. Um, they're rather dirty in some ways on the environmental front, but um, that's life, you might say. And um, our country, and certainly that province, could be rich at the level of Norway with any degree of reasonable management whatsoever. And I think that's true for the whole country. Quebec itself has enough natural gas to provision itself for 200 years, and they won't touch it for reasons that are so diluted that it, it defies comprehension. The Chancellor of Germany, who was a socialist, and that's relevant given that hypothetically he's in Trudeau's camp, came to Canada less than a year ago, cap in hand, because the Germans were desperate, because they've been following idiot green policies for far too long, and Trudeau said, well, we can't make a business case for shipping you liquid natural gas. Well, and the reason for that is he made it impossible for anybody to make a business case to do that even though the Germans were prepared to offer tens of billions of dollars to us with on unbelievably favorable terms that were very long term in scope. And so we turned away one of our greatest allies in the West, left them in the hands of the bloody Russians and the Qataris so that our idiot prime minister could virtue signal pointlessly about destroying the fossil fuel industry in a manner that will make Canada poor and help the world not one bit. Right, and then the Prime Minister of Japan came and asked for the same thing and got exactly the same treatment.
And so now Alberta is landlocked, unfortunately, and it's next to a province, the province British Columbia, and British Columbia is a coastal province, and it tends to be woke and socialist, partly because it has Vancouver attached to it. Um, and so Alberta can't get its fossil fuel resources out through, out to the world on the West Coast. And so that's a complete bloody catastrophe. And the new premier there, Danielle Smith, she's gonna end up essentially going to war with Trudeau. It's enough to break up the whole damn country as far as I'm concerned. And there's a, there's an, uh, what, an irritable part of me that thinks that would be for the best. So what we're doing in Canada on the energy front is utterly insane. It's utterly insane. And, and why do I say that? Well, I say that in li not least because I saw what happened to Germany. If the Greens would have managed to increase the price of electricity, but maintain its reliability and cut the pollution associated with its production, that would be one thing. But what they did instead was make it so expensive that even electric battery manufacturers can no longer afford to operate in Germany. They made it utterly unreliable. They killed off their nuclear industry, which was to call that insane is to barely scrape the surface. They made it much more expensive and it's way more polluting than it used to be because now they rely on burning lignite. So how in the world, unless you're aiming at disruption, which I do believe is what the psychopaths on the green side are aiming at, by the way, unless you're aiming at disruption and impoverishment and mass misery, every single bit of that reeks of failure by the criteria of the people who put the policies in place. And we're running down that road as fast as we can in Canada so that Trudeau can pretend that he is what? A paragon of moral virtue and keep up his, his grip on whatever the hell he regards as power.